Are you fireproof? Or are you flammable? Who will you serve? Yahweh or another way? Which path will you choose as Jesus spoke? The narrow path which leads to eternal life or the broad path which leads to destruction? We have two choices of how we live and whatever and whoever you choose to serve, that's the one that you call master or Lord or King. Who do you belong to? Who owns you? Or would your friends even, would your family, would, would, would even your church identify you in this way as a servant of the Most High God? If you are to go through the fire rather than to avoid it, and if you are to receive the blessings that are found in it rather than to forfeit them, you need to be... We've just heard read Daniel chapter 3, verses 18 to 30, and what we find in there is the continuation of a story that we started last week. And so if I could just take us back for a moment, because in the, the story of Daniel chapter 3, if we could just imagine for a second what we would have seen were vast crowds of people flocking forward to get closer to the event that was happening in front of them because, because the event happening in front of them was of such a nature that they couldn't look away. Three Israelite young men, defiant and faithful, standing before the most powerful king in the known world, and he was furious. Lawyers and philosophers would have been standing with arms crossed, scowling at these three young Hebrew men. Astrologers and sorcerers would have stood sneering with contempt at these three Hebrew boys. And then, and then further back, as we move through the crowds of people, we see mothers holding their children tightly towards them, not just because of the palpable heat from the fire that could be felt, but also because of the tangible tension in the air. For the king was furious. Young children would of snaked and squeezed through the people, trying to get a closer look at what was happening. Three young Israelites who did not conform and be like everyone else. They did not bow down to a statue made of pure gold and worship the king of Babylon. They defied the command of the king and publicly declared their faith in Jehovah, their God. And for this, they were about to face the consequences which were threatened and promised to them if they continued to defy the king. They would be executed, thrown into a furnace of fire that, that had now been heated seven times hotter than it already was. A furnace once used to melt pure gold now being used to melt men. They claimed that their God was able to deliver them, and he would. But the question we now come to this week is will he? Will he deliver them from the fire? If he does, then that would mean that these three men are fireproof. Fireproof and Ridgeway Church. The reason that I am here this 
morning is because the time has come for you and I to become fireproof. The time has come for you and I to learn and to grow and to step into our calling and our purpose to be fireproof. And oh, how we need it. Because the Bible speaks about fiery trials. Fiery trials that we will all experience. There's not a person in this room. There's not a person online. There is not a person anywhere who has not experienced trials of fire, moments, events, and seasons that are just too hot for us to handle. A loss of our job, a breakdown of our family, financial trouble, rejection from from people we know, people we love because of the convictions that we have, our patience being tested, condemnation and shame being thrown at us from the enemy, sickness and grief being ostracized and rejected emotionally and mentally overwhelmed and on and on, fiery trial after fiery trial. We all experience them, Uh, but the question is not, will you experience them? The question is, will you make it through them? Are you fireproof or are you flammable? That as soon as the flames of hardship hit, you just melt. Or are you fire retardant? Which means that you don't melt as soon as the flames hit, but over time, slowly, as the flames get hotter, and hit a little harder, you just melt into displeasure and despair. Are you flammable? Are you fire retardant? Or are you fireproof? Unable to receive harm and hurt from the flames, protected from the scorching heat of suffering and struggle. Well, today, through three Israelite young men and one mighty God, you and I have the pleasure and the privilege uh, to learn how to be fireproof and to receive the blessings that come with it. And to do that, I want us to look at Daniel chapter 3, verses 18 to 30, and discover three things. First of all, I want us to see the portrait of a fireproof follower of Jesus. Second, I want us to see the persecution of a fireproof follower of Jesus. And then third, I want us to see the promises for a fireproof follower of Jesus. A portrait, the persecution, and the promises. And the portrait is where we will begin our time. And the three Hebrew lads, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are the portrait that you and I are going to set our eyes upon. They are the example that we want to learn from. Because in them, we see five points that make up a portrait of a fireproof follower of Jesus. And the first point is that a fireproof follower of Jesus serves God. Have a look with me at verse 26, where it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the entrance of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared. So this is their enemy, the one who hates them, the one who's furious with them. And this is how he identifies them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Servants. Now, that word in Daniel chapter 3, serve, serving, or servants, uh, those words are used seven times in Daniel chapter 3 to identify these three men. And those words refer to someone who is not their own, but belongs body and soul in life and death to their master. It refers to someone that has 
voluntarily surrendered their will and their desires. And that they now serve their master and his will and his desires. It is no longer they who live, but it's their master who lives in and through them. That's what a servant is, someone who serves, someone who is serving. And what's fascinating is that in Daniel chapter 3, this word is continuously used to describe a crossroads, a choice that you have. Who will you serve? Will you serve the God of Israel? That is one option that they had. Or will you serve the king of the Babylonians? That's the other option that they had. And thousands of years on, church, we have the same options. The crossroads is exactly the same. Who will you serve? Yahweh or another way? Which path will you choose as Jesus spoke? The narrow path which leads to eternal life or the broad path which leads to destruction? We have two choices of how we live and whatever and whoever you choose to serve, that's the one that you call master or Lord or King. So I want to ask you, who do you serve? And in your head, in in your heart, I want you to answer, who do you belong to? Who owns you? Whose will, whose desires do you live for? Would your enemies, or would your friends even, would your family, would, would, would even your church, identify you in this way as a servant of the Most High God. A fireproof follower serves God. But secondly, the second point of a portrait of a fireproof follower of Jesus is that they serve God and they trust, and they trust God. They trust him. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him. The pagan ruler identifies these three young men as those who trusted in their God. When the heat was hot, when the flames were fierce, they trusted in their God. Now that word trusted is not a passive word, it's an active word. It's something that you do, you trust, you you actively put your trust in God. Often we think of faith as a passive thing, I have faith. It's something that's just there, but that's not the case. True faith is alive and active, which means you actively do not put your trust in other things but you actively put your trust, your confidence, your belief in your God. That is a fireproof follower of Jesus. They do not trust in possessions, programs, policies, pastors, or popes, uh, but they trust in the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ, him and him alone. And so a fireproof follower of Jesus serves God and trusts him. But also the third point, they serve, trust, and they follow him. We see this again in verse 28. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who trusted in him. And then what? And set aside the king's command. Set aside. That word set aside means to ignore. To break. To go another way. They hear it. They see it. But they ignore it. They break it. They go another way. Which means that these three young men, under the tests of pressure to conform and compromise, broke and disregarded the king's words and went another way. And which way? God's way. The only other way. Two choices. They ignored what the king spoke and listened to what the king of kings spoke. That's a fireproof follower of Jesus. Oz. Guinness puts it like this. For the followers of Jesus, that's us, the voice of the people must never be taken as the voice of God. 
That's a follower of Jesus. The voice of the people must never be taken as the voice of God. And if God is our master, we only follow, we only bow down to the voice of God. Whatever pressure, whatever confusion, those who are fireproof open their eyes to the book and open their ears to the Holy Spirit and they learn and listen and follow the voice of God. So a fireproof follower of Jesus serves, trusts, and follows. They also sacrificially surrender themselves for their God. Verse 28 again. And remember, this is their enemy who is identifying them in these ways. This is what they see. And it says, these three men who yielded up their bodies, yielded up, sacrificially surrendered, rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. They got two choices. They got two choices. And the choice they pick is to physically yield. They, they chose to give up their arms, to give up their legs, to give up their minds, to give up their mouth, to give up their ears, to give up their eyes, to give up their time, their futures, their energy, to serve and worship God. That's what they chose to do. Now, I know that many of us in church don't mind when the preacher speaks about surrendering spiritually, because that's something which we can kind of hide away and put on the inside, right? But what we struggle with then is when the preacher starts to speak about surrendering and sacrificing physically. Because that comes with a cost that we can't hide. We can't hide. But this is what God wants. God didn't just save your heart and your soul. He saved your hands and your feet. And he owns it all. He made it all. There is no Christianity without surrender and sacrifice. Our faith is foundationed in the fact that the God of heaven became man and surrendered himself and sacrificed himself for us. And faith is a response to do the same for him. It is no longer I who live, but he who lives in and through me. This life that I once lived in the flesh, I now live by faith in the one who loves me and gave himself up for me. And surrender begins with asking yourself a question. What do I love most? Because the answer to that question, what do I love most? The answer to that question is what and who you will surrender and sacrifice for. And so a fireproof follower of Jesus serves, trusts, follows, sacrificially surrenders, but also uh, finally they worship God. They worship God. Verse 28 again, they yielded up themselves rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. And so their enemy identifies them as ones who don't worship anything else but their own God, Jehovah, Yahweh. This word worship in chapter 3 is mentioned more times than any of these other previous points of the portrait that I have spoken. The word worship is mentioned more times, numerously more times. The word worship means to bow down, to respect, to recognize another as, as, as your ruler, as superior to you. It, it, it means to give another the glory, the authority, the power, and the love that you recognize them to be worthy of. And in Daniel chapter 3, worship is the central theme. Worship is the central theme, and that's because Daniel chapter 3 is asking us a vital question. Who do you worship? The answer to that meant that these boys would either die or live. And the answer to that will mean that you either eternally die or live. Who do you worship? And this question is vital because human beings are created to worship. From Adam and Eve to every human being that has come after them, we've all been created with a soul. We've all been created with a purpose to worship. 
And again, we have those two options. Who will you worship, Yahweh or another way? We are created to worship, and all of life is choosing between those two options, now on earth and for eternity. Who will you worship? And if you haven't already made that choice, I plead with you. I plead, worship God. Worship Jesus. He's the only one who's worthy of worship. And if, and if you do worship him, if you have made that choice, I want to challenge myself and challenge us. Uh, let's not choose to worship Jesus with the wrong motives, the wrong hearts. Let's not come to Jesus with the wrong hearts. Uh, because uh, sometimes we can, worship, we can choose to worship Jesus for his hand rather than for his heart. Uh, we can choose to worship Jesus primarily because we want something from him. We want peace. We want joy. We want healing. Now, Jesus, he gives all those things and more. Uh, but first and foremost, Jesus wants you to worship him because of who he is. Because he's our God, our Savior, our Lord, our King, our friend. Uh, whether we live or die, whether we are poor or rich, that is enough reason to worship him. And so we don't want to come to him with the wrong motives. Not like that young lady who wrote a letter to her ex-fiancé. Where she wrote, Dearest John, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. Oh John, please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. Congratulations on your inheritance. We don't want to come to Jesus with all the right words but the wrong heart. We want to worship him for who he is. The one who is able to deliver us, and he will, but even if he doesn't, I will still worship. And so this is a portrait, church. This is a portrait of a fireproof follower of Jesus. And, and, and if you are to go through the fire rather than to avoid it, and if you are to receive the blessings that are found in it rather than to forfeit them, you need to be fireproof. You need to be fireproof. But, but listen to this. You need to be fireproof before you even touch the flames. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 2, these three Hebrew boys were exactly the same as we see them here. They were already fireproof. They were already serving. They were already trusting. They were already following. They were already sacrificially surrendering. And they were already worshipping. If we are to be fireproof in the furnace, we need to be fireproof before the furnace is even switched on. And so it begins today. We want to be fireproof. But if you are fireproof, and if you choose this day to choose to be fireproof and to pursue that, then I need to tell you, there is a reaction to every action. There is a reaction to every action. Because every fireproof follower of Jesus, every faithful Christian will experience persecution. The Bible says so. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Indeed, the apostle Paul says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will what? Be persecuted. He doesn't say maybe, will be. Charles Spurgeon observes that God's people are often in a fiery trial. And that fiery trial can either be prepared by man, prepared by Satan, or prepared by God. But we're often in them. And whoever the source of the fiery trial is, the reality is that if we live as fireproof, we will receive fiery trials. We will. And we should. We absolutely should. For the supernatural, fiery trials should be natural. The Apostle Peter, he said so in 1 Peter 4 verse 12. He says, beloved. He starts with that, beloved. Do not be surprised. Don't be shocked at the fiery trial. When, not if, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. 
Don't be surprised as if something strange was happening to you. Some people have been told, some people think that the more faithfully you live as a Christian, the less problems you will have. I've got a testimony. That ain't true. That is prosperity theological nonsense. Try telling that to the apostle Paul who had his head chopped off. Try telling that to the apostle Peter who was crucified upside down. Try telling that to Jesus who was crucified for our sins. Living faithfully for Christ, Jesus said, if they hate you, it's because they hated me first. Because you're looking like me. You're sounding like me. They're going to hate you. Peter's saying, don't be surprised. For the supernatural people of God, persecution and fiery trials are a natural consequence. But, but, being fireproof, therefore, does not mean that we can avoid them. But what it does mean is that we can go through them. And I want to tell you this morning that it is better to go through fiery trials than it is to avoid them. Because in the fire, there are promised blessings we would not receive outside of the defire. There are promised blessings we would not receive outside of the fire. And those blessings, church, as we go from the portrait, the persecution to the promises, are protection, freedom, and fellowship. Protection, freedom, and fellowship. One of the first things that caught my attention as I was reading Daniel chapter 3 was found in verse 22 to 23. Just listen to this. Because the king's order was urgent, he was so furious, and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those mighty men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery f furnace. This furnace uh, had been used already to melt all of that pure pure gold, and therefore it would have been at a temperature of 1,064 degrees um, Celsius. The king so furious, he says, heat it up seven times more. So it's now in the 7,000 degrees Celsius. That's hot. Real hot. So hot, in fact, that Nebuchadnezzar's mighty men, the Babylonian SAS, are burned up as soon as they opened the entranceway. Incinerated. But the Hebrew boys that they're holding are not. They are thrown in and they fall in. And you would expect after a fall like that into the scorching flames of a 7,000 degree Celsius furnace that they would be immediately incinerated. But that's not the case because very soon after they fall in, we see them standing and walking around. You see, the fireproof followers of Jesus receive a blessing that the unbelieving mighty men do not receive. And that blessing, church, is the divine protection of God. God's hand was on these boys. I'm sorry, but I think that is an amen there, right? Like this is, this, is, this is pretty good preaching, okay? Because this is pretty good truth. God's hand was on these boys. Now, now I know, I know that you and I want to avoid these fiery trials because of the pain, but listen to me. God never leads you where he won't protect you. In work and in play, in life and in death, God never leads you where he won't protect you. You and I can walk through hellfire with a water pistol if God is with us. Who could be against us? That's why you and I are still standing today. That's why you and I can be in church this morning and still sing today after what we've been through, 
And I know that some of you have really been through, but you're still standing, you're still singing, you're still going. Because Satan thought he could bring you down with that lie, with that accusation, with that sickness. But not today, Satan. Not today. Why? Because there's no weapon formed against me that will prosper. There is no tongue that rises against me in judgment that I will not refute. God is my refuge and strength. A very present help in what? Times of trouble. Hallelujah. Isaiah 54, Psalm 46. This is the word of the Lord. In the fiery trials, church, we are promised the blessing of protection. But not only that, there's more. We've got the blessing of freedom. For whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. So come back with me to Daniel chapter 3, verses 23 to 25, and listen to this. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound, tied up, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And his counselors, they answered and said to him, oh, that is true, O king. But then King Nebuchadnezzar answered back and he said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire. Oh, church, I hope you see what I see because I'm getting excited because this is perhaps one of my favorite scenes in all of scripture. These three men are thrown into the fire, bound up, but then we see them walking around freed up. They were thrown into the fire, bound up. We then see them walking around, freed up. This is, this is one of the reasons why God allows and chooses for you and I to go through the fires. Because, listen to me, there are some things in your life, some things that are binding you, chaining you, tying you up, some things that are hindering you and oppressing you and holding you back that can only be burned up and broken in the fires of suffering. Be it a, a addiction or anger, lust or laziness, moaning or complaining, an independent spirit or an arrogant heart, overeating or over drinking, shame, pain, hurt, an unhealthy friendship, a wrong relationship. There are some things that outside of the furnace you can't get freed from, but in the furnace, God breaks for you. And I know that's, that, is not, that is not a teaching we want to hear, but that's the truth. Freedom is God's promise, and how he brings it is his prerogative. Your promised freedom, and how he brings it is Prerogative. One pastor said it like this, most Christians long to see miracles, but they don't want to be put in a position where they will need one. Be careful what you pray for. I know I've experienced this. I remember exactly where I was years ago when I prayed to the Lord, Lord, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. Make me like Jesus. But I didn't expect that the answer to prayer would be so hot. Because several years ago, I went through the worst three years of my entire life. And in those three years, God brought up every sin in my life. He brought up every secret in my life. He brought up every pain and every hurt that I had. He, he plowed through my heart, my mind, and my soul, and he brought up everything that did not belong in a child of God. And it was painful, so painful. And, and I'll be honest with you, I tried to avoid it. That's probably why it went on for three years. I tried to avoid it, but eventually God taught me I had to go through it. And praise God, I did. Because in that furnace, I received freedom. In that furnace, I received 
a testimony of protection. In that furnace, are you ready for this? I received joy. In the fiery trials, we lose what binds us, but we find joy. We find joy. But I don't want to tell you about that. I want the Bible too. Because this chapter, Daniel chapter 3, is written in the, 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 the Aramaic language. And in verse 25, it says that these Hebrew boys were found unbound and walking. And the Aramaic word there for walking actually translates as walking confidently. Walking confidently. These boys were not merely trudging through the the furnace of fire or tiptoeing around the flames. No, these boys had swagger in the fire. Walking confidently. They had, they had swagger in the fire. How? Well, we're, remember, they trusted God. They had confidence in his protection. Confidence in his power. Confidence in his presence. And when you have confidence in the good God of the impossible, you can strut in your suffering. When you have confidence in the good God of the impossible, you can strut in your suffering. The joy of the Lord was their strength. But the joy of the Lord isn't finished with them yet. Because if you go to the ancient Septuagint translation of Daniel chapter 3, that text tells us that they were not just walking around the fire. Oh, this is good. They were walking and singing in the fire. And it tells us that it was their singing which caught King Nebuchadnezzar's attention. These boys were filled with such confident joy in the Lord, such blessed assurance that they were not only strutting in their suffering, but they were singing in their suffering. And of course, that kind of behavior will catch the attention of any unbeliever. It did so in Acts chapter 16. I I can't help but think of Acts chapter 16 when I read this. When Paul and Silas are in prison, and in verse 25 to 26 of Acts 16, it says this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to the Lord. They're chained up in prison, praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly... There was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. The foundations shook, the doors were opened and the chains fell off. Hallelujah. Now I know that there are people in this room who need foundations shook, doors opened and chains falling off. And if you get fireproof and if you get in the fire, And if you start walking through the flames, and if you start singing in your suffering, then guess what? Foundations shake, doors open, and chains fall off. That's the promise of God. Worship is our weapon. Singing is our siren to an unbelieving world and to Satan himself. That we may be persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We may be struck down, but we are not destroyed. Even in the worst of times, Christians can have the best of times because God is our protection. God is our freedom, our confidence, and our joy. Hallelujah. The blessing of protection, the blessing of freedom, but but there's another, and it's the sweetest promised blessing of all, the blessing of fellowship. Fellowship, verse 25 And the king looks in the window of the furnace. He's expecting to see ashes. But instead, he says, I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Church, there is a fourth man in the fire. There is a fourth man. Three went in, but then there's a fourth man in the fire. And and he's not like 
other men. The pagan king, he, he, he thinks he knows it. He thinks he's like a son of the gods and oh, he's so close. But if King Nebuchadnezzar just had eyes to see and ears to hear, then he would know he's not like a son of the gods. He is the son of God. This is Jesus. This is what theologians call a Christophany, an appearance of Christ on earth before he came to earth in the flesh. An appearance of the Son of God, the pre-incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ on earth. And he is seen with them in the fire. He wasn't seen with them before the fire, nor was he even seen with them after the fire. But he's seen with them in the fire. This is why we can't avoid it, but we've got to go through it. Because there is a fellowship with Jesus that is only found in it. God assures us of this in Isaiah 43 verse 2. Listen to this. Our God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. Now, as with most promises, there is a premise to the promise that God has just handed to us. And we can't ignore the premise to the promise because the premise to the promise is that to experience God in the fire, you have to walk through the fire. Or did you see it? When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. This is why we can't afford it, but we've got to go through it. Because there is that sweet fellowship with Jesus that's only found in it. If these three Hebrew lads were not fireproof, if they were lukewarm or part-time followers of God, even, even church, if they were 99% faithful, but 1% they allowed to compromise and conform, they would not have received this blessing of fellowship with Jesus. To find Christ in the fire, you've got to walk in it and walk through it. And can I also add, you need to give the world a reason to heat that fire up for you to walk in it and to walk through it. You've got to be fireproof. And this motivates me. This motivates me. Because I want Jesus. I want him. I want to be close to him more than anybody else. I want him, the one who died on Calvary's tree so that I, a sinner, could be set free. I want him. The one who holds me with nail-scarred hands, I want him. The one who no longer calls me servant but calls me friend, I want him because he wants me. And it's in the fire that I'm told I can have him. So, Lord, if you must, take me into the furnace. If that's where Jesus is found, then take me in and don't let me out until I find him. God, I will not let you go until you bless me with fellowship. That should be the cry of every Christian, no? Shouldn't it? Wasn't this the experience of the psalmist in Psalm 23 who declared that he knew the Lord as his shepherd? He knew the Lord's rest, his provision, protection, his confidence, his comfort, and his goodness and mercy that followed him all the days of his life. But where did he declare it? Where did he experience it? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's in your suffering that we get a sweetness of the Lord's presence. In John 15, Jesus tells a parable that he is the vine and we are the branches and his father takes care of the branches god wants us to bear fruit and grow and become all that we are made and saved to be so the father's job is to prune us and someone who looks after vines and branches is for roles they observe the branches they feed the branches they protect the branches and they prune them and those first three have no pain involved. But the fourth one, the pruning, the cutting, the slicing, the picking, the prodding, that's painful. But out of all four roles, it's in the pruning that the Father's hand is closest to the branches. 
It's in the pruning that the Father's hand is most close to you. That's why we sing, what a fellowship. What a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. In Daniel chapter 3, we don't know whether the Israelite young men were aware of the presence of Jesus or not. It doesn't tell us, and I think that's important, because what it teaches us is that in your suffering, you may or may not be aware of the presence of Jesus, but you can be assured of the presence of Jesus. There is a fourth man in your fire, whether you see it or feel it or not. He has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He has promised to walk with you, to talk with you, and tell you that you are his own, even in the furnace, especially in the furnace. He may not deliver you from the fire, but through his protection, his freedom, his fellowship, he will deliver you in the fire, and his deliverance is complete. Not a thread on their clothes was singed. They didn't even smell. And a fireproof follower of Jesus does not smell. Hallelujah. Because God delivers us. It is Jesus that makes every test a testimony. Amen. And so all of this means, as I end, all of this means one thing. It means that the one thing you don't want to go through may be the one thing that God wants to use to free you, that God wants to use to grow you, that God wants to use to help you. Many Christians do not experience the fullness of life and blessing God has for them because they are not willing to become fireproof and are not willing to go through the fire. Now, before I sit down, just very quickly, at the end of this chapter, we read that King Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth man in the fire, and he saw the deliverance these three Hebrew boys experienced, and he fell down and he praised God and said, there is no other God who rescues like this, and that's absolutely true, and that's absolutely right. There is no God who rescues like this, not money, sex, or power. There is only Jehovah who rescues like this. And maybe like King Nebuchadnezzar this morning, you, you have seen Jesus as the fourth man in the fire and you're thinking oh oh I need to leave behind whatever I'm holding on to and I need to worship and recognize that he is the only God who can rescue I need to be a, like these men I need to be fireproof I need to be what Jesus says I need to be born again what does that mean we've all been born once naturally Jesus says be born again a second time spiritually become new and that happens through how ABC you need to admit your sin, believe in Jesus as your Savior, and commit to him as your Lord. And I'm about to pray a prayer to end our time. And as I pray this prayer, I'm going to help you to admit, believe, and to commit. And so I want you to pray that prayer in your head and in your hearts as I pray it. And if this day you pray this prayer in sincerity because you want to become a Christian, then at the end of our service, come to the front and come and speak with me and I'll pray with you and I'll help you along on your journey of new life. But we're going to pray. And so I'm going to pray this prayer. And as I pray this prayer, I want the worship team to quietly come back up to the front as we go to God in worship through song one last time. It is Jesus himself in John 3, 16, who said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What Jesus is saying there is that, yes, as a Christian, I will save you in the fire, but also I'll save you from the fire, the fires of hell. And so we want to be born again to be saved from those fires and so I'm going to pray this prayer and you can pray it in your head and in your heart dear Lord Jesus I admit I am a sinner something in me is broken and I cannot fix it I have not lived as you made me to live I have done wrong and I need a savior I believe Jesus you are my savior I believe you alone can can fix me I believe you love me and you came to earth to save me I believe on the cross you died for me. 
taking my sin, my shame, and my punishment. I believe you took hell for me so I would not have to. I believe, Jesus, that three days later you rose from the dead to give me a purpose on earth, a place in heaven, and a relationship with God, my Father. And so I commit to turning from my sin and to following you as my Lord and my Master. I surrender my life to you, Lord Jesus. I love you. In Jesus' name, we said, amen.